Pod Save America is brought to you by ProFlowers. Have you ever forgotten your anniversary? Yes. Okay. If you're not nodding yes, which Tommy did, you're lying. I'm not married. <laughs> We're going to make it easy for you. Pro Flowers is the Pod Save America go-to for flowers. They're fresh, priced right, and a perfect gift for literally anyone. My mom sent us flowers at the late show with Stephen Colbert because she got the flu and couldn't come. It was so nice of her. We showed up. There's a big bouquet of Pro Flowers. Yeah. She cried. She got sick and couldn't come. But it was okay. That was sad, but it was very nice <laughs> of her to send Pro Flowers. I love you, Mom. <laughs> So we have a special offer just for our listeners. Get $10 off your purchase of $29 or more. This deal works on best-selling gifts like their 100 Blooms Bouquet, a dozen red roses, or even their totally unique plant gifts. Love it loves the plant gifts. He does. To snag this great deal, just go to proflowers.com and enter code CROOKED at checkout. They're guaranteed fresh for seven days of your money back. So do yourself a favor. Help out our show by supporting ProFlowers. Uh, we know you have either a birthday or anniversary coming up, or just a reason to send someone some flowers. We know we have your. We just know this. We guys. know. So right now, get ten dollars off your purchase of twenty nine dollars more at Pro Flowers. Perhaps you want to send Pro Flowers to Devin Nunes. <laughs> yeah, he's had a tough day. Hey. He had to recuse himself <laughs> for an investigation because he sketched out at the White House. What is a recusal gift? <laughs> it's Pro Flowers. Maybe it's the plant gift. Yeah, it's probably like a funeral package. <laughs> So, right now, get $10 off your purchase of $29 or more at ProFlowers. Just go to ProFlowers.com, enter code CROOKED at checkout to get the special deal. Who needs love it? (laughs) (laughs) Welcome to Pod Save America. I'm John Favreau. I'm Dan Pfeiffer. On the pod today, we have a packed show. We'll be talking to the president of Planned Parenthood, Cecile Richards. We have special guest, Obama's Deputy National Security Advisor, friend of the pod, Ben Rhodes, will be talking to us about unmasking, and the host of Crooked Media's With Friends Like These podcast, Anna Marie Cox. We've basically become like Morning Joe here today. Oh, I I have have not yet told you Donnie Deutsch is going to be showing up in your New York studio (laughs) moments from now. Can I be Willie Geist? And Tommy's here. (laughs) Willie Geist is here. I'm not going to talk. I'm just going to hide in the corner. (laughs) Tommy's playing. Love it so mad he's not here today. (laughs) We told him he couldn't come. Um, Okay. So, before we start, a reminder, please subscribe to all of our pods. Tommy's Pod Save the World. He's got some excellent guests coming up. Anna's with friends like these. Love it or leave it this Friday. Anna's got a show in Pasadena on Saturday she's going to tell us about. We still have tickets to the LA show at the Ace Theater uh, in downtown Los Angeles. There's t-shirts, there's merch available on getcrookedmedia.com right now. All kinds of stuff, Dan. When I did an event last night with friend of the pod, Alyssa Mastromonaco here in San Francisco. You mean New uh, York Times her, best-selling author, Alyssa Mastromonaco? That's exa- that is exactly right. Uh, charter member of the Pod Save America book club. And <laughs> people, the, the San Francisco friends of the pod were talking a lot of shit about the LA friends of the pod and why they wouldn't sell out the event. Ooh, that's rough. I'm just, I'm just saying. I mean, I, I, I don't know. I guess I'm going to have to work harder down there. Okay, so... We have some breaking news this morning that happened before we recorded this podcast, which can only mean that there will be more breaking news after we're finished. But um, our great friend, our dear, dear friend, Devin Nunes, uh, chairman of the House Intelligence Committee, has recused himself from the Russia investigation because the House Ethics Committee is investigating Devin Nunes for unauthorized disclosures of classified information. Poor Devin. Does that make him one of those leakers that Donald Trump is so upset about? <laughs> I mean, apparently his antics at the White House didn't go over too well when he jumped out of an Uber to sneak into the White House um, and <laughs> and look over classified information and then report to President Trump that he had just uncovered some classified information about Trump and his associates being caught up in incidental collection of foreign surveillance. And it turns out that his source was the White House. That's still my favorite part of this is him in with great showmanship rushing back to the White House to tell the White House the things the White House told him. <laughs> I mean, what a fucking clown show. Yeah, um, he's the worst. So his statement is whiny as ever. He blames left-wing activist groups for these charges, um, which actually they're triggered by various rules and, and laws in Congress. Um, although there were complaints filed by our friends at moveon.org. So good job. Um, now, as he steps oh, as he steps aside and recuses himself, so he's still going to be, uh, he's still going to lead the House Intelligence Committee, but he has to recuse himself from this specific investigation. So who's taking over for Devin? <laughs> Mike Conaway, 
uh, who is who? a long time. Who is Mike Conaway? Mike Conaway is a long time Trump supporter. Um, he was like on one of these campaign advisory committees. So very, uh, you know, uh, very by the book, very nonpartisan. Um, he was the one during the hearing with Comey a couple of weeks ago who um, couldn't understand that if the Russians wanted Hillary to lose, they therefore wanted Trump to win. He couldn't quite get that zero sum game. Um, ask that question. <laughs> he's a very he's a very bright bulb. Um, and it will also be led by Trey Gowdy. Oh, noted independent-minded investigator Trey Gowdy. Trey Gowdy, he of Benghazi fame. <laughs> yes, Benghazi. Tom, Tommy is seething in the corner. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, that doesn't that uh, that does not inspire confidence uh, in this investigation to me at all. It does not. Um, I don't know what what do you think about this whole thing? What does it what does it tell us? I guess it just tells us that Devin Nunes is the idiot that we all thought he was. Yeah, the only real takeaway from this is Devin Nunez is dumb. That, that's it. I mean, <laughs> I don't know that the uh, the new, the quote unquote new investigation is going to be seen as any more credible. And this may just be a way station on the journey to an actual independent investigation. Right. And I don't know what kind of. T- I, I did read somewhere that the House Ethics Committee will have. Um, I mean, it's a committee that's going to be bipartisan, and it will have subpoena power. They said that they actually might have Paul Ryan come testify to find out why and what Devin Nunes, why Devin Nunes came to him after he learned this information at the White House, and what Paul Ryan told him or didn't tell him um, to do after that. So, uh, all kinds of people getting caught up in this little, in this little incident. Can we make a plea to the people of Fresno to find? the most credible and competent person who lives in David Nunez's district, district and run against him. Yeah, he absolutely. Seen, I know it's a district that is like a plus 10 Republican district in the last election, but he seems pretty beatable. And we're certainly not going to beat him if no one runs against him. So, And I also suspect if you live in Fresno and you're thinking of running for president, or running against David Nunez, and then maybe for president, but <laughs> you're going to have no trouble raising money. Like that person is yeah. going to be a well-funded campaign. Speak, speaking, uh, of well, and, speaking of well-funded campaigns, by the way, did you see John Ossoff uh, wrote, uh, he had $8.4 million that he raised. <laughs> is that Bin Laden supporter John Ossoff <laughs> to the mailers being sent in his district? Yeah, it was a long journey from John Ossoff from aspiring Jedi to, uh, <laughs> to dangerous Bin Laden operative. You're going to get destroyed in your mentions for <laughs> suggesting that Han Solo was an aspiring Jedi. <laughs> no, I'm saying I, John Ossoff I, was. No, no, no. Yeah, that's, that's what I mean. That's what I mean to John Ossoff. Because I once did the, these are not the droids you're looking for joke on this pod wrong, oh, and it took like three weeks to get my mentions back. <laughs> I don't read my mentions anymore. Um, <laughs> that's kidding? the biggest lie you've ever told. That's true. That's true. Yeah, Not quite as often as Levitt does, but I do. Um, okay. So... Yeah, so go run against Devin Nunes as someone. Um, there are two districts, that, there are two counties that he represents. One, Hillary, one the most populous county, actually, Hillary uh, won in the last election. She beat Trump, and then Trump won the other county that's a little less populous. It's still, a, an, a, like you said, an R plus 10 or something like that. But, um, but yeah, be on the lookout. Um, so the whole Devin Nunes thing stemmed from, um, as when he went to the White House to find out this information, we now know from this last week that it was about the unmasking of certain officials uh, reportedly tied to the Trump transition team uh, who were incidentally caught up in foreign surveillance. Um, Eli Lake of Bloomberg News reported that the Obama official who had requested that these um, unnamed identities be unmasked to find out who they are was Susan Rice. This has resulted in a whole pretend fake scandal on the right and in conservative media over the last week now. And um, we have been flipping out about this for a couple of days. And uh, you and I were just going to talk about this ourselves, but we thought, why not bring Ben Rhodes on? He's the crooked media unmasking correspondent. Yeah. <laughs> so we're going to call Ben and we'll be right back. This is Pod Save America. Stick around. There's more great show coming your way. Pod Save America is brought to you by Harry's Razors. 
For decades, one big razor company has relentlessly increased prices and reaped immense profits at the expense of its customers. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Tough hit at the top Attack of the Harry's ads. ad. Attack ad. So Jeff and Andy, two ordinary guys who were fed up with getting ripped off, started Harry's to fix shaving. I love Jeff and Andy because they're so ordinary. They're so you ordinary. Know. They could be anyone. Could be anybody. Harry's knew there was only one way to ensure quality, so they bought their own blade factory. By taking less profit and selling directly to you over the internet, Harry's offers their blades at half the price, just $2 a blade compared to the $4 or more you'll pay at the drugstore. That's a good deal. Try Harry's for free. Harry's is so confident you'll love their blades, they're giving you their trial set for free. Just cover $3 shipping. Your free trial sets include... A weighted ergonomic razor handle. Ooh. You do not want to get carpal tunnel from your nope. <laughs> from nope. your razor. Don't mess around. Five precision engineered blades with lubricating strip and trimmer blade, rich lathering shave gel, and a travel blade cover. <laughs> that is a thirteen dollar value for you to try. <laughs> it's blade five, the one set in uh, L.A. I know it's blade three. <laughs> we were on the Colbert show last night, and we got we all got Harry's razors there yeah. too. Yeah, that's e- pretty nice. Everyone's, everyone's doing Harry's. Everyone's doing it. Stop messing around and start shaving with Harry's today by claiming your free trial offer. Thirteen dollar value for free. Just cover shipping to get your free trial set. Go to harrys.com slash crooked right now. That's harrys.com slash crooked. Pod Save America is also brought to you by Squarespace. If you've ever tried to start your own website, you know what a hassle that can be. Tanya. <laughs> Especially if you don't know what you're doing. So make your next move, make your next website with Squarespace. Create a beautiful website with Squarespace's all-in-one platform. There's nothing to install, patch, or upgrade ever. Squarespace provides award-winning 24-7 customer support and will get you your own custom domain with an experience that's fully transparent and simple to set up. Squarespace is used by a wide range of creatives, people, and businesses. Musicians, designers, artists, restaurants... Podcast host. I should set up a Pod Save the World Squarespace page. I really should do that. It's easy. It's absurd that I haven't. There's nothing to install, patch, or upgrade ever. Oh, That's what they great, say here. I don't know what I'm doing. So make your next move. Lock down your domain and create a website to launch that idea. Use offer code CROOKED for 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. That's CROOKED for 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain with Squarespace. If you listen to this, please don't lock down Pod Save the World. I really want to lock that one down. Don't do it. <laughs> Joining us here at the top of the show, Obama's former deputy national security advisor, good friend of the pod, Ben Rhodes. Ben, welcome. Hey, guys. First time, long time. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, we know you've been on Pod Save the World, but we thought we'd, uh, we thought we'd start introducing you to the Pod Save America world here. So, Yeah, I'm trying yeah, to not, There's the not much overlap over those audiences. Yeah. True. <laughs> um, okay, so I want to set up the uh, Susan story really quickly and then ask you a few questions about this. So uh, I believe it was on Monday... Bloomberg's Eli Lake reported that Ezra Cohen Watnick, the National Security Council's Senior Director for Intelligence, was conducting a review of the government's foreign surveillance practices, as one often does. Um, Now, this is the guy who the current National Security Advisor, H.R. McMaster, tried to fire until Steve Bannon and Jared Kushner stepped in to save his job. Um, So, during this review, Ezra discovers that former National Security Advisor, our friend Susan Rice, requested the identities of U.S. persons in raw intelligence reports on dozens of occasions that connect to Trump's transitions and campaign. That is from Eli's story. Uh, This is known as unmasking the identities of these individuals. Um, So I think we should start here. Ben, what is is the process of unmasking? Why would you do it? Um, How common is it? Could you just sort of describe the process for everybody? Yeah. The first thing people have to understand is this is neither uncommon nor is it a process that is controlled by any one official in the white house Um, so anybody of susan rice's rank in the government or anywhere near that rank receives thousands of intelligence reports over the course of the year notably they don't even necessarily select what reports they get Uh, so susan comes to work she gets a bunch of intelligence every day that the intelligence community thinks will be important for her to see. Mm-hmm. Um, so she's not uh, shopping through a menu of intelligence. Her briefers, the people who, who brief her on the intelligence, bring that to her. There are occasions when there could be an intelligence report uh, that involves a U.S. person talking to uh, a foreign government uh, or foreign adversary of some sort. Um, and the process that has been uh, called unmasking is simply if someone looking at that report says, um, well, who is that person? I don't. I can't understand this report. I can't understand what I'm reading if I don't know who this person is. Um, and then the intelligence community, uh, not Susan Rice or any other official, they determine whether or not to provide 
that name to the inv individual, and that's it. And it's routine, and anybody who served at a high level in a Republican administration or a Democratic administration uh, has had this happen in the course of their day or week or month. The fact that someone is unmasked does not mean that that name was shared widely. It does not mean that that was leaked uh, in any way to the press, which would be, uh, of course, uh, something uh, improper. Um, so, in other words, this is a routine way in which the intelligence community interacts with their customers in the government. Uh, and frankly, nothing is being alleged that Susan Rice did anything wrong other than doing her job and asking questions about the intelligence that was being presented to her. So the completely bullshit Wall Street Journal editorial on this uh, said, quote, Rice would have had no obvious need to unmask Trump, camp of Trump campaign officials other than political curiosity. So that's, that seems wrong in at least a dozen ways, right? <laughs> That's simply not the case. If you are being shown intelligence that the intelligence community has determined is important for you to see, you want to understand that intelligence. Um, so, you know, it, whatever the report is, let's say it doesn't involve a U.S. person, you're going to ask questions about it. Well, what does this mean? You know, why is this important? Uh, so similarly, if the intelligence report, and I'm not even familiar with the reports that they're referring to, but if the intelligence report had a, uh, a U.S. person um, it, it's only natural that the person being briefed on that might say, well, wait, I don't fully understand what I'm being shown here. Who, who, who are we talking about here? Uh, and again, uh, even if she learns that information, um, it in no way suggests that she does anything improper with it other than going about her day. Um, so uh, I think what they've done is try to conflate this very routine process of reviewing intelligence with leaking, when those are entirely different things. And there is absolutely no reason uh, that just because someone would unmask uh, an intelligence report that they leaked it. That, that's, drawing that inference is the same thing as saying anybody who received any intelligence ever must have leaked that intelligence report, uh, because the unmasking is just the typical way in which people are processing uh, intelligence reports that they have questions about. So one question that people keep asking is, apparently when Susan was on PBS, um, she was asked about Devin Nunes' statement that some Trump officials were caught up in surveillance and had their identities revealed, and she said, I, I know nothing about this. Um, what do you think she meant by that? Was that she, it was because certain information was classified and she couldn't say anything? Is it because it was, uh, you know, the question was identities revealed, which sounds like it was leaked? Like, what do you think she actually meant by that? Well, I don't, I don't know. Um, what I would uh, suggest is, you know, the allegations that have been made over the course of weeks here to distract from the core issue of Russia's meddling in our election to help Trump and the potential collusion between Trump associates and the Russians, um, is that somehow uh, the focus of the investigation should not be on uh, the initial uh, issue of what did Russia do uh, and how did they uh, collude with the Trump organization uh, to do it, uh, but rather were there leaks. Um, and so I think Susan has no, you know, nobody has any idea how information is, is leaked. Uh, particularly right. when you have a report like Adamantus that says there are nine officials from across the intelligence community and the government who are providing this information. So I think uh, uh, the, the point is uh, that the processing of intelligence in our government uh, does not in any way make clear how information was leaked. So, Ben, in the bubble of idiocy that's made up of the conservative media's discussion of this story, it's become conflated with this idea that this means that the Obama administration was surveilling the Trump campaign, the Trump transition. Can you sort of explain just generally how a Trump associate could have ended up um, in some of these reports? Yeah, I mean, and we went, first of all, let's step back and let's talk about what really happened here. The president of the United States tweeted something that was completely false with absolutely no evidence uh, that is an outrageous attack on his predecessor. Uh, who has had an impeccable record of integrity. And then ever since that happened, an ecosystem of right-wing media and certain members of Congress have done anything they can to find any shred of information that they could somehow distort into corroborating what is clearly a false claim that they will not, that they will not take back, that they will not apologize for, even though they have never presented any evidence for it. Now, in terms of uh, the question, the U.S. intelligence community gathers intelligence. 
Um, and they gather intelligence on lots of foreign governments. Um, and hypothetically, because I'm not going to get any classified matters, I think it would not be unusual for Russia to be a target of U.S. intelligence collection. Um, so when you talk about incidental collection, um, hypothetically, because again, I, I, I'm not talking about any specific intelligence reports, uh, you're talking about whether or not people might have been in touch with targets of U.S. intelligence collection. Now, those targets would always be foreign targets. Uh, the, the only way in which there's a, a U.S. person who is subject to surveillance is if there's a law enforcement proceeding, which could not be directed by the White House. That's something that is done by the FBI and our law enforcement community. Uh, so, uh, again, the only question on incidental collection here uh, is if the intelligence community is routinely collecting on a foreign government or adversary, uh, and there may be uh, some U.S. person who is in touch with that foreign government or adversary. Yeah. So, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> no, I was going back and forth with Eli Lake on this this morning on Twitter um, and, and, and arguing with him about this. And basically his argument towards the end was he was like, I don't think the standard for unmasking is rigorous enough. And I was like, my, my thing does, I'm like, OK, Eli, well, if you guys want to have a debate out there in the media about the standard for unmasking like that's one debate to have but the debate that's currently being had is like should susan rice go to jail <laughs> here's the question here's the question though this is an important question do, do you, you suddenly you're shocked shocked that the intelligence community does collection right uh, and you're shocked shocked that if someone talks to the russian government that they might have be incidentally collected in that uh, collection uh, if you are if you really have some sincere if you've developed in coincidentally the spring of 2017 after Donald Trump tweets this, you've suddenly developed an interest in the kind of arcane practice of unmasking of U.S. persons who are subject to incidental collection. Uh, well, that's like a policy issue. Right. That has nothing to do with what Susan Rice did. Do they want to, are they going to talk to all the former Bush administration officials uh, who might have participated in unmasking? Or are they going to say anybody who's ever unmasked? Uh, that is, is a crime. Uh, they're criminalizing uh, the way in which the U.S. government has approached these issues under multiple administrations for many years. Why is Susan Rice the only person who they're interested in as it relates to a fairly routine intelligence procedure? Uh, I think that suggests that the interest here is not you know, some, some newfound desire to change the way in which the entire U.S. intelligence community operates on these issues. Um, they're trying to smear Susan Rice to justify uh, a tweet that was wrong and that has been completely unsubstantiated and for which they have no evidence. I also think it's important to realize, like, the whole the definition of unmasking is you don't know who the person is before you unmask them. So how could she have known that she was targeting Trump officials? She didn't know who the person was in the report, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah it would. If she did that. Point. <laughs> yeah, she that's the whole it. point. And, and, and again, she doesn't do the know. unmasking. Yeah. <laughs> so are you saying this story might be bullshit? <laughs> well, I, you know, I mean, th that's the point here. Like, th 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 this is, they've had a, a, a story without any supporting material that they've been in search of ever since Donald Trump tweeted what he tweeted, which was wrong about President Obama. Okay? And, and each time they do, it gets knocked down. This one, for whatever reason, uh, they had sufficient outrage manufactured in their own media ecosystem uh, that they dragged the rest of the news media into covering it. But it doesn't make it any, any more wrong than it would have been otherwise. What Susan Rice did is not wrong. It is routine. And again, if they want to apply this standard across the board, then they have to go, are there people in the, does this mean that nobody in the Trump administration is doing any unmasking? Does this mean that no other officials Forget the White House, in the Defense Department or the intelligence community, under our administration or the Bush administration, nobody else ever did any unmasking. That's simply untrue. So if they're really just concerned about the practice of unmasking, then they, they'd have to look at what has been done by everybody across the history of having intelligence surveillance capability in our government. But if they're really just interested in Susan Rice, they're not even alleging that she did anything wrong substantively. Because unmasking is a routine part of her job. She needs to understand the intelligence that is being brought to her. Let's be very clear again. The intelligence community brings information to her. She doesn't select all the intelligence that comes to her. She gets reports. She asks questions about those reports. The intelligence community makes decisions about whether to answer her questions by revealing the identities uh, of persons who might be 
named in those intelligence reports. The fact that that unmasking happens in no way suggests that intelligence leaks any more than if anybody in the U.S. government has access to an intelligence report, that means they're the one who leaked something to the press. Uh, so this is all just a sideshow distraction. There's not any evidence that has been presented that Susan Rice did anything wrong. Uh, and yet again, they are assassinating her character, as they have been doing for years, even though she's a person of integrity, the person who's put up with a lot of garbage for many years and still put her head down and served our country. I sat in on this interview just to scream about this one thing, which is this is the hashtag Benghazi right wing fever 2.0, right? Susan Rice had absolutely nothing to do with the security at our consulate in Benghazi, which the lack of security there is why those individuals died. But they attacked her over talking points, right? The, the attack on her today has nothing to do with civil liberties or the process of unmasking. It's that she has become a target on the right wing. And guys like Lindsey Graham and Rand Paul and all these right wing media hacks who feel like they need to get well because they've been criticizing Trump for being an absolute, unhinged, uninformed, awful president for months and months and months, now think, okay, here's how I can get some of my right-wing bona fides back. It is total bullshit. This is outrageous bullshit. And for the President of the United States to accuse her of committing a crime is defamation of character. That's all I got. It feels like we might be adding a and, rant and wheel way, to the I, Pod Save the World show. Yeah. Well, and says, to be very clear here, and Tommy doesn't swear in Pod Save the World, he's much more sober. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a different audience, I guess. But like, He's like let, the Fareed Zakari of the Crooked Media Empire. <laughs> Well, and I, but I said this like, like this notion of, uh, you know, criminalizing the routine governmental actions of your predecessors, that that should be very worrisome to people. You know, th this is not like, you know, the standard. He creates a controversy. This is not a campaign where we have to try to. If there's a bad story for somebody, we have to have a bad story for somebody else. This is this is somebody who has awesome powers of the presidency, who's just decided to justify his own tweet to criminalize the very routine work uh, of the previous administration, uh, the, the work that is not illegal, that was conducted by the previous administration. Uh, so I think every now and then people take a step back and realize this isn't just like, oh, he's saying some crazy things and that's what he does and we'll all cover it because anything he says we'll cover. No, like let's step back here and say, why are we, why are we, why are we covering this if there's no there there? Why are we focused on something that is simply not true? It is not true that Barack Obama ordered wiretapping. It's not true that Susan Rice, even if she did do this unmasking, did anything wrong. So, so what is this really all about, other than an effort to make the Russia story about anything other than the Russia story that is there, which is Russia interfered in our election to elect Donald Trump, uh, and there is an investigation that we've been told publicly by the FBI is ongoing into potential collusion. Yeah, I mean, and what gets what drives me really crazy is this is not just like Trump saying crazy things like Trump does and then like Breitbart and Infowars and Sean Hannity like pushing it. This is just about every member of the conservative media is all over the story. This is the Wall Street Journal editorial board. This is the Weekly Standard. This is the National Review. This, you see, they're all like and this it's bleeding into the mainstream media, too. Right. Like because they all scare mainstream media journalists into saying you're not covering the Susan Rice story. Why aren't you covering the Susan Rice? story and so then they do it because they're worried about this pressure and the pressure fucking works and it's unbelievable well, when, did, when did the pizza gate guy become the assignment editor for the new york times <laughs> <laughs> like, this, is, this is crazy well you and know? i'll say i read that i read that whole transcript with maggie and glenn uh with their interview with with trump and like it, they did fine, but like I do not know why Glenn Thrush had to use the word crime when he asked Donald Trump, "Did she commit? Do you believe Susan Rice committed a crime?" Glenn could have easily said, "Do you think Susan did something wrong? Do you think what she did was unethical? Do you, th you know?" And he, there was no reason to say the word crime, and that that, and then of course Trump's going to say yes because Trump's a fucking idiot and he's going to say yes to something like that. And now it's in headlines. Now crime is in the lexicon. Yeah, I've really, I've really wrestled with that with the Thrush thing because. It's not it's not Glenn Thrush's job to understand that Donald Trump to like understand that Donald Trump's a child and right. would say yes. I get that. It, right. So I mean, so he's sort of doing because it really he, the question goes to like whether it's serious or not. Right. Is if you're pissed about this thing, did you do something illegal? And the answer is obviously no. But Donald Trump's too dumb to know that. Um, so it's sort of like by asking the question, he basically led Trump into accusing Susan of a crime, but do you adjust your questions because the person you're interviewing has the intellectual curiosity of a 
third grader. I get that. I'm just wondering, that's, like, where the word an, crime comes from. That's unfair to third from. graders. You know, like, why, yeah. why do you even? Why yeah. are we even at the word crime? There's, there's, there's nothing she did wrong. It was her job to do unmasking. But my point is that, like, I'd say a couple of things. One, if he's a candidate and he just pops off like that, it's one thing. But if you are, you know, and maybe you want to get him to say something newsy. But if he's the president of the United States and he's saying that this is a crime, that's a different matter. When it's not a crime and he presented no evidence that it is. The, the second thing that's concerning is we know because of the conservative media ecosystem that they've built, that anything he says, a, a, a large percentage of the country will just think it's true. And now Susan Rice has that hung around her neck. And that the New York Times helped enable that. And look, I have a lot of respect for, for Glenn and Maggie. They've done some great reporting. And it's a tough, it's a tough thing for them to, 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 to deal with. Totally. But the other thing that d- distressed me in that interview is when he's like, you haven't written enough about this. You, know, you must write more about this. Who is he to tell them, you know, like, sure, we tried, we advocated, you know, we liked stories told, we were in communications offices, um, but this notion that, like, because something is being covered by Fox and Friends, that it has to be covered by everybody else, I think that that can be rejected. I sound like Barack Obama rejecting notions here, but <laughs> I think that, that, can, I think that, that like, there's no reason that just because, like, you've created a wildfire from InfoWars and Fox and Friends, that that has to cross you know, cross the guardrails into the rest of the media covering it just because it's being covered. Yeah. And I, and like, I, I do have respect for Glenn and Maggie, and especially like when you read the transcript of that full New York Times interview, if you can get through it without thinking that you've gone completely insane, it's like they have to sit there and interview someone with the capacity of a four-year-old, really. <laughs> and that's that's like, I, that, no offense to four-year-olds. He had six people babysitting him for that interview, <laughs> including the chief of staff, the vice president, Gary Cohn, six staffers sat in on that interview. Go re- every all, all conservative intelligentsia, go read that full interview and, t- and, and, and you let me know that you're safe with Donald Trump as president. Go ahead. Go read that. (laughs) The thing that's so funny about the staffing is when we were in the White House, you basically drew short straws to see who had to staff the president for the interview because you're just sitting like a potted plant for 45 minutes when you could be doing real work. Right. Certainly the vice president never (laughs) staffed the interview in the history of of time. Okay. Well, we're going to have to go because we we have to go talk to Cecile Richards now. (laughs) (laughs) She's going to be calling in and we're going to talk all about activism and all kinds of other good hopeful stuff but um man thank you ben for helping us unmask this yeah. <laughs> that's what i'm here for <laughs> Thanks, all right man. we'll talk to you later bye all right see you guys. uh so before we get to cecile um let's talk about zombie trump care when we last left trump care it was a, a failed rotting corpse a bill with 17 percent approval that would have forced 24 million americans to lose their health insurance and raise premiums for millions more um but it's back dan it's back is it? Is it back? I don't know. Um, in, you know, in an effort to win over the Twitter eggs and the Freedom Caucus, um, apparently, you know, <laughs> there was a, it's a dated uh, reference now. <laughs> yeah, there's no more Twitter eggs. It's really sad. Um, so last we left them, there was a last minute attempt to get rid of the requirement that every health insurance plan cover essential benefits like hospitalizations, doctors' visits, everything you need in health insurance. So this scared off the Republicans in competitive districts who faced all of you good people who showed up at their town halls, right? So now, in an effort to revive this thing, uh, the new twist to get the Freedom Caucus back on board is to say, okay, what we'll do is we'll let states decide whether or not they want to keep these essential benefits. This was an effort to like both get the Freedom Caucus and the, moder- and the uh, moderates. Plus, as a sweetener for the Freedom Caucus, what we'll, what we'll do is we will gut protections for pre-existing conditions so that insurance companies can charge cancer patients whatever they want. Yeah, it is. It's worth noting that the single most popular part of Obamacare by far Supported by even people who hate Barack Obama, is the protections on pre- people with pre-existing conditions. That's it. and so their strategy is: we're going to take this bill with 17 percent approval rating, and we're going to take out the most popular part of that of that 17 percent approved bill. So this seems like a pretty good strategy. Well, also, I mean, Donald Trump has promised explicitly he wouldn't touch pre-existing conditions. Uh, the Republicans in the Better Way Healthcare Plan said that they wouldn't touch pre-existing conditions because it was an important principle. So, like, this is going to... I, I can't imagine... This has to be a non-starter for just about every Republican who is ever worried about their election. 
<laughs> like, I, I yeah. mean, forget just moderates. Like, regular Republicans have to be worried about this. Like, I don't know how this flies. Now, what they're doing today is, because apparently there was this long meeting last night where um, Mike Pence and people in the White House and Paul Ryan were all, like, yelling at each other. And they said, Donald Trump wants something passed. And they want Paul Ryan to pass a bill. So get something done. And so they're trying to add high-risk pools. Um, which is basically where they would send people with pre-existing conditions who can no longer afford coverage because you've gutted pre-existing conditions. The only problem is um, what you do with these high-risk pools is they're going to add a, they're going to add a, a little money for this, but not nearly enough money to cover everyone with pre-existing conditions in this country. Also, high-risk pools don't really work. They limit the amount of coverage you can get. Sometimes it takes 12 months to even get insurance in a high-risk pools. So they they've failed before. It was this was a pre-Obamacare thing. They're bullshit. They don't work. And I, I don't know. I, but the the key is what I want everyone to understand is recess is coming. Um, their members of Congress are going home for recess for two weeks and they have not voted on this bill and they think that temperatures will cool once they come back from recess. But so we're doing resistance recess again, move on indivisible, all these groups that did it last time. Um, you can go to resistancerecess.com slash cricket to sign up, find a town hall near you, um, go to your member's office if they don't hold a town hall or hold a town hall yourself and let your member of Congress know how upset you are at this new zombie Trump care bill that's taking shape because uh, it is going to be even worse and hopefully less popular than the last one. And if people are making noise in these two weeks when they're when members of Congress are home, there's no way um, they'll be able to pass this when they come back. Yeah, everyone in Washington is focused on the Freedom Caucus, which is right. I mean, it, they're kind of like the freaks of the circus, so it's kind of amusing, but it's not really what matters on this bill. It What matters is the moderates who were fleeing from the bill uh, is what really what kept it from being voted on was all these moderates who are worried. Some of them are in districts that Hillary won in 2016. They're nervous about how they will survive if there's a, a anti-Trump wave in 2018, so show up at the town halls like this is the way to drive a stake into this stupid fucking thing i also thought that the political story on the meeting they had at the white house is pretty amazing because basically it was like bannon kushner who was taking time away from saving the world and do everything else he does um shadow president and, and, jared kushner shadow president and their uh and they're legislative people. And basically the Trump people were saying that if they don't pass something, they're worried they're going to lose their jobs, which is a really good motivation to take healthcare away from people. Yeah. This is Pod Save America. Stick around. There's this great stuff coming. Lots of great stuff. <laughs> Pod Save America is brought to you by ZipRecruiter. Are you hiring? Yep. We are. Do you know where to post your job to find the best candidates? Nope, we don't. Posting your job in one place is not enough to find quality candidates. If you want the perfect hire, you need to post your job on all the top job sites. And now you can. With ZipRecruiter.com, you can post your job to 200 plus job sites, including social media networks like Facebook and Twitter, all with a single click. Find candidates in any city or industry nationwide. Just post once and watch those qualified candidates roll in to ZipRecruiter's easy to use interface. Do you think that's how they found the new intelligence chairman? I hope not because it's it's Trey Gowdy. Gowdy. <laughs> I know. Doesn't speak well. Of it seems like he's been on a lot of those posting yeah. sites for a long time. Yeah. But a bit of a retread. Terrible. Anyway, it's easier to use interface. No juggling emails or calls to your office. You can screen your candidates and hire the right person fast. So find out today why ZipRecruiter has been used by Fortune 100 companies like Crooked Media. <laughs> And also thousands of small and medium-sized businesses. And right now, our listeners can post jobs on ZipRecruiter for free by going to ZipRecruiter.com slash crooked. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash crooked. On the pod today, we have with us uh, the president of Planned Parenthood, Cecile Richards. Cecile, welcome to the pod. Thanks for having me. So you have a very long background in politics. You began your career as a union organizer. You worked at a voter registration organization. You were deputy chief of staff to Nancy Pelosi. Um, what made you decide to join Planned Parenthood? Well, it's an organization that obviously has changed so many women's lives, including me. I mean, that was the first place I went for birth control when I was in college. And 
I also felt it was an organization that could be even a stronger movement. And we spent the last um, 10 years building Planned Parenthood not only into a healthcare provider that sees about two and a half million patients a year, but also uh, enlisting and engaging. Now we've got 10 million supporters in the U.S. who not only fight for um, rights to health care, but women's rights more broadly. And it's been an awesome experience. Um. So a, a recent poll um, by Celinda Lake found that 86% of the calls to Congress over the last couple of months uh, have been from women, that women are leading yep. the resistance. The um, question we've been asking a lot on this podcast is, how do we sustain the energy and activism we've seen over the last few months for the next four years? That seems to be the real challenge. We- it is a challenge, although I'd say if, if any group probably gets the uh, prize for resilience, it is women, as I feel like women have been in this fight for a long, long time. Uh, and I, I mean, a lot of people ask me now, they, re, they went to the marches or they saw the march, and you know that was obviously such an important moment that day after the inauguration. I think those marches were really, they, they took place because women knew there was going to come a day when we'd have to really fight with everything we've got to protect not only women's rights, but women's lives. And obviously that day is already here. So I think these last three months have been very, very tough in terms of this administration and this Congress. And But the the really good news is, to your point, women did not quit after they knitted their hats and went to march. I mean, they have been showing up at town hall meetings. They've been calling members of Congress I think a lot of the issues that were at stake in this uh, attempt to repeal the Affordable Care Act and attempt to um, end access to Planned Parenthood really fueled the kind of energy that we've seen uh, all across the country. And I, look, women are not going to you know, go without a fight, and they're definitely not taking this lying down. And it has been exciting not only to see women who've been doing this for their entire lives, you know, who've marched for for decades, but also young women and young men who've never participated in anything like this before. And that, that sort of intergenerational energy is, it's infectious. It's very exciting to see. Cecile, what, as you think about this new administration and this Republican Congress, what are the, do you see as the most immediate threats to uh, to women? For, well, what are the policy moves they could do that most concern you? Well, I mean, every single thing this, this government has done or this administration has done, I think women have been probably the, the uh, on the receiving end. Uh, so certainly the efforts to repeal the Affordable Care Act, that, I mean, that whole, the, the Affordable Care Act was really a bill, um, a piece of legislation that improved women's access to health care. And so that was an immediate threat. And as you know, you know, the they had predicted that this would be on the president's desk January 27th. And ever since it was proposed, and, and ever since the defunding of Planned Parenthood was proposed, I think women have been throwing sand in the gears, you know, really speaking up and trying to prevent it, because it was not only was going to take away health insurance coverage for millions of um, Americans, millions of women, but it also was the, it it would, you know, as we've now heard from many of the negotiations that were going on, and I I assume will continue to go on now with the Freedom Caucus and others, it would have ended women's um, access to maternity benefits. Um, There are proposals to, of course, get rid of the the gender rating um, protection that we've had, which allowed women to not have to pay more for health insurance than men. I mean, there was a proposal in the recent iteration that would have said that women on Medicaid who had a baby would have to go back to work within two months or lose their med- their medical benefits. So I think the, you know, the loss of affordable health care, and then, of course, the, the attempt to block women from coming to Planned Parenthood, these are all huge economic issues for women. And I think that has been the clearest first signal but look, it's not limited to that, as you know. I mean, they've, you know, they've stepped back on the kinds of protections that we put into place under the Obama administration on sexual harassment and on wage discrimination. Globally, I mean, they have, well, the list is very long of the kinds of things that they have done that are not only going to damage women's access to family planning and health care, but literally women are going to die as a result of some of these policies. And uh, so I think that's why you're seeing so much energy. So it's been reported that, um, and we don't know if this is going to happen yet or not, but that the Freedom Caucus um, will refuse to fund the government. 
unless Planned Parenthood is, quote, defunded. Um, first, can you talk about that shorthand defunded? Because I know that's a bit of a misnomer. But then more broadly, um, what do you plan to do about this? Okay, I'd love to um, address both those things. Because first, yes, it's completely fictitious that there is a defunding in the sense that we're not in the federal budget. Mm -hmm. So when Paul Ryan says they're going to defund Planned Parenthood, what it really means is they're saying we're going to actually block through legislation the ability of patients to come to Planned Parenthood for preventive health care. And that is important for folks to understand because we at Planned Parenthood operate just like every other hospital or health care provider in that we get reimbursed from the federal government when, when we see patients for preventive care. Not abortion services, because those aren't paid for by the federal government, but this is basically blocking folks from coming to us for family planning, you know, well woman visits, cancer screenings, uh, and the like. And we see about two and a half million patients a year, and half of our health centers are in medically underserved communities. So basically what Speaker Ryan is trying to do is say to folks who choose Planned Parenthood as their health care provider, you can't go there anymore. And that is what has literally, I think, fueled the outrage because one in five women in this country has gone to Planned Parenthood for health care. Uh, there's really not anybody in America who hasn't somehow uh, been touched by this, this organization. So that's what the fight's over. And, um, and also, it wouldn't save the government a dime. In fact, it would cost the government money because of the, I mean, even the CBO has been very clear about this, of the loss of health care coverage for women and the rise in unintended pregnancies um, as a result. But it does appear that the Freedom Caucus and Paul Ryan are just hell-bent on making this uh, their signature issue, uh, even though the most recent poll I saw, I think the Quinnipiac poll right before the vote that did not take place, is that 80% of Americans support federal funding for Planned Parenthood preventive care. And that means a lot of Republicans yeah. and a lot of independents um, and a lot of their own, their own voters. But we may get down to this. Um, as you, as I'm sure you remember, uh, the Republicans tried this under President Obama, and he was such a stalwart champion, not only of Planned Parenthood, but of women's health care, that he literally said, nope, it's not going to happen. Um, but now, you know, anyone who votes in this Congress to end access to Planned Parenthood, that, it's, it's not a free vote anymore. Uh, it's a vote that literally could end access to care for millions of folks in this country. Um, the, the Daily Beast this morning reported that you uh, – had a what they called secret meeting with Ivanka Trump in January. Um, what can you tell us about that meeting? And do you think uh, do you think maybe it had any effect on Trump's thinking <laughs> on this issue? <laughs> uh, well, I mean, I could say you know she reached out, and of course I'll talk to anybody about Planned Parenthood yeah. any day. And I thought it was important that she understand like who we see how devastating it would be for women if, in fact, um, the Republicans push through a, um, and, you know, this blocking of folks from coming to us for health care, explain to her how Medicaid works, explain to her the fact that there are no federal funds for abortion services because all, all, the, all the other myths that are out there. Um, and it doesn't seem to have had any impact in that. I mean, the president himself has tweeted about Planned Parenthood, although I guess that's a that's that's not a big distinction, I suppose, anymore. But, um, (laughs) you know, I I think that the the truth is, you know, every attack that they've made on us has only increased our popularity because, you know, because folks are now focusing on, oh, God, what would it mean if there wasn't an affordable health care provider for women anymore in my community? Um, So but we will continue our efforts to educate everybody in Congress and anybody in the administration that wants to listen about uh, why we're an uh, an organization that so many folks count on uh, and that, you know, we've been around, we just celebrated our 100th anniversary and um, we're going to, we're going to be around for a hundred more years. You know, we hear from our listeners and other people all the time who are looking for ways to get involved. It's a way to be, you know, be part of the quote unquote resistance or yep. people who are motivated for the first time in politics. And how should people who want to get involved and help Planned Parenthood do that? I'm so glad you asked. Uh, so I've got a couple of ideas. Great. Um, one is you can sign up actually on our website to be a defender of Planned Parenthood. We have thousands of people who we are in touch with regularly about what's up either in their state, because, of course, all the fights aren't federally. You know, they're, they're in uh, state legislatures all across the country. The other thing is your listeners could do is text 
fight, the word fight, to 22422, and that way you can be part of our mobile action network. Um, And, I mean, we have been overwhelmed by the number of supporters who've joined up, so that's really exciting. Um, We've got folks in every single state, every single congressional district, uh, and, and again, we're mobilizing people to call their call their members of Congress because this this is going to be ongoing. I think as you as you reference, this is not a sprint. This is a marathon. This is going to be at least a four year campaign to protect access to health care. But I've been really excited. Again, I think a lot of folks thought after the after the march, well, what's going to happen next? But it has been I mean, we've seen, as you probably already know, you know, record numbers of calls going into Congress. And for anyone who's listening, it makes a difference. I spend a lot of time now on Capitol Hill talking to members of Congress, um, spending time in the Senate, and it absolutely makes a difference. Uh, And it makes a difference when folks go back home, as they will here for a couple of weeks, and they see women in pink pussy hats and uh, other folks talking about the important care they received at Planned Parenthood. Um, That's really been gratifying. And we've had a ton of patients who have spoken out at town hall meetings, sometimes in very to very hostile members of Congress about their own experience, you know, cancer survivors who had their cancer detected at a Planned Parenthood. Uh, we think it's important that, that members of Congress understand the impact of what they are considering here. And I, again, I think it was um, at least uh, in part why so many members of Congress, Republican members, refused to support um, Trump care or this most recent iteration of, of Trump care. Uh, one last political question for you, because you are a Texan. Um, I am a Texan. You are indeed. a Texan, and I wear it proudly. And yes. we're <laughs> we're obviously all very interested in turning Texas blue. Uh, we know some folks who are working <laughs> on doing that. How do you think it's going down there? How do you think the um, the Democratic Party is doing? Sort of the the progressive movement in Texas. Um, I know this is a long project, but um, what kind of progress <laughs> have you been have you been seeing down there? Um, it is a long project. It's true, uh, but. <laughs> I, I mean, look, I think that the future is definitely um, going to be much better for folks in Texas. One of the problems that you probably know, John, is that we just are a non-voting state. Mm-hmm. And I think that the discouraging thing for progressives down there is just it's been so long and redistricting is so completely skewed um, towards one party that it's been difficult to make progress. That said, if you look at what happened in this last election in the urban areas, um, in in all the major urban areas uh, except for Fort Worth, you know, Democrats won, and mm-hmm. obviously um, Hillary Clinton did a lot better there than I think most people would have expected. Um, so I think the most important thing that's happening now is or, or that people are running for local office. And again, we're seeing this around the country. I mean, really record numbers of women now wanting to run for local office. That to me is how they're going to have to rebuild down there. Um, but I, I, you know, I think the other thing that is going to happen, and, and this is something like I just, I just saw this in Wisconsin, you know, women aren't necessarily organizing through the party. They are just organizing. They're self-organizing. I was yeah. just in Kenosha, Wisconsin, you know, in, in Paul Ryan's district, Speaker Ryan's bis- district, because we have three health centers there, and all of them provide the preventive health care that they would be blocked from providing under his proposal. And was, I was meeting with some patients in, in Kenosha. Uh, they not only did a press conference, and these are women who said, look, I was always a supporter of Planned Parenthood, but I was a quiet one, and I, I realized I can't be quiet anymore. So not only did they do that, and, and a couple of them flew to Washington to actually speak, uh, try to speak to uh, Speaker Ryan, they've now organized – Forward Kenosha, which is their own grassroots group. They have 1,500 members. Um, and one of them is now talking about running for office. So I think what we're seeing, too, and, and this is true in Texas as well, is these kind of homegrown efforts of people who are realizing they can't wait for uh, a party or a candidate to save them. They're going to have to actually organize themselves and turn, and, and turn the direction of this country um, in a better place. Yeah, we've noticed the same thing, too, is that I think the, the the really exciting thing is that the energy from this next movement is coming from the grassroots, and it's coming not from the traditional party structures, but from groups that are popping up all over the country of people who are uh, who want to want, who want to run and want to make a difference and want to yep. have their voices heard. And I think that's... Absolutely. That is the hope. So, Cecile, yep. thank you so much for joining us today. Um, good luck with Absolutely. everything. Have it. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Okay. Come back again. Take care. Okay. Bye-bye. Thanks, Cecile. Don't go anywhere. This is Pod Save America, and there's more on the way. If you haven't, everyone go download the Cash app.
If you haven't downloaded it by now, come we on. have a problem. Dan Pfeiffer just used the Cash App to pay for uh, to pay for housing at uh, at my wedding. Oh no way, <laughs> really? <laughs> Emily asked him for the money, and he said, "I hope you have the Cash App, Emily, because that's how I'm paying you." She was like, "Of course I do." And she, and she immediately it downloaded it, my rent, and that was the transaction right there. <laughs> he was excited to tell it on today's pod, but he's not on the phone yet. Yep. Anyway, it's the simplest way to pay people back. Download the Square Cash App. You get money deposited instantly into your account. So you can download the Cash App for free on iOS or Android today. Also, by the way, you should probably order stuff with Postmates. You can order food. You can order just about anything delivered to your house. You can order headphones for Love It. You can order <laughs> a giant pair of yellow headphones for Love It. Right. A muzzle. muzzle. West Hollywood. <laughs> a muzzle. A leash. <laughs> <laughs> it's so fun doing the ads. It's though. so fun. <laughs> I get to talk. Anyway, <laughs> download Postmates. If you haven't used it before, put in the code CROOKED. You get $50 of free delivery. It's awesome. It's great. On the pod, we have the host of With Friends Like These, Anna Marie Cox. Anna, what's up? No, oh, I am, I am, I am in, we are like nearish each other, I think, here in the same city. So, good, hello. Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> hello from like across the island. How are you? Do you want to just, I'm... should we make our plans to get together now on the phone? <laughs> People like that. Just let everyone hear the sound. Right? We'll give like a time that. and a place for all of yeah. our listeners. Um, it's basically a it's a pot, it's a crooked media flash mob situation. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Um, Just between you and me and a couple, you know, tens of thousands of people. I'm yeah. sure it'll be fine. All right. Okay. Um, so let's start with um, a, another friend of the pod, Jared Kushner. <laughs> <laughs> you uh, you wrote a piece this week about Jared Kushner called "Too Connected to Fail." By the way, great headline there. I love that. Yes, I have to um, uh, give a little tip of the hat to Dan Dresner, the uh, Washington Post uh, columnist and professor at the Fletcher School. Um, he and I were talking about Jared, and he's he's the one who sort of uh, led me to that phraseology. So I will connect that he he came up with it. He's also I shall uh, plug him. He has a book out right now called The Ideas Industry, I think, oh. which actually gets at some of the things that Kushner's you know weird sudden rise to power um, yeah. kind of uh, puts into the conversation, which is that we're a fetishization of business as a source for ideas and thinking that you sh- that government can or should be run like a business. Um, and also the I- idea that outsiders to government will have some kind of insight that people on the inside don't have. Yeah. Um, we, I'm curious, I'm curious, what do you think? Well, I was going to ask you this. Because, I mean, we, we didn't get to talk about this yet today because it was quite a packed show. But um, Steve Bannon was uh, kicked off the NSC. So that's mm-hmm. a good thing, I suppose. Although I'm guessing he can sort of drop into any national security meeting when he wants and mm-hmm. walk into the Oval and advise Trump of whatever. But that sort of spawned a few other stories about infighting in the West Wing. Maybe rumors that Bannon's on the outs. Um, a couple sources that said he threatened to quit over this NSC thing, getting kicked off the NSC. Um, and he's been very angry that Jared and Ivanka and the New York and Gary Cohn and the New York set has been sort of gaining power, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so this led, of course, of course, to uh, in Axios this morning, them <laughs> saying that like, so like the normal camp, right, is like Jared and those people and, and they're doing traditional things on healthcare because like a traditional thing on healthcare is to like you know take away 20 take away healthcare for 24 million people in gut pre-existing conditions mm-hmm. very mainstream mm-hmm. um and foreign policy in china and all this stuff and so you know maybe there's this sort of notion that these are the these are not the good guys but at least the moderate guys in yeah. charge right or the moderate gang because it includes ivanka and and dina powell as well um but I don't, I mean, I don't know. What do you guys think about this? I don't think, I, I don't sleep well at night know, thinking that like Jared Kushner is running the show. Yeah, Dan, wait, I mean, I can go. I mean, I, <laughs> I, I have not, I mean, he's 36 years old. So that in and of itself is a problem. And then the other problem is that his portfolio is just, it's either a lie or it's inhumanly possible for him to be in charge of everything he's supposed to be in charge of, which is everything from opioid epidemic commission to um, streamlining the government to apparently, you know, overseeing um, this uh, visit from the Chinese, which, by the way, the reporting on that has been interesting. It's that the Chinese are totally comfortable with Jared being the point person, because in China there is a tradition of what they call princelings, 
you know, the <laughs> children of those in power, especially in an authoritarian government where people aren't elected, is sort of natural for, for the families of those in power to have a lot of power themselves. I mean, I'm uncomfortable with it, but the Chinese love it. Dan, what do you think? <laughs> my, my favorite thing about the Bannon part, at least, is that, like, we all joked months ago that if we just call him hashtag President Bannon, it'll upset Trump and he'll get rid of him. And, and he was just that simple. It worked. <laughs> <'Cause> the, <laughs> our because hashtags the, and our uh, memes you, worked. <laughs> yes. The, the hashtag resistance. The, yeah. Because it's not, it's not that he has screwed up 700 things. If you listen to the reporting is why Trump is mad at Bannon. It's that he has taken too much of the limelight. Yeah, that Time Magazine cover, man, you know, like yeah. that just that was the last straw or but not not the travel ban. The travel ban wasn't the problem. Right. It was calling yeah. it was hashtag President Bannon. And that is terrible. And I you know, and I also want to point out it's terrible that we're it's kind of terrible that we even have to talk about this. Like you guys can speak to this. How often did did we really talk? Did, did the media discuss the makeup of the National Security Council during the time you guys were in Washington? Um, not a lot, because. <laughs> Look, and to be perfectly honest, when they discussed the makeup this time around, I had to study up and ask Rhodes and Tommy because I wasn't completely sure like what it means to be on the council versus being in the principals committee meetings, which is versus being in the deputy meetings, which, you know, are all things that happen in the White House that I had heard of, but I didn't know the exact structure. So I mean they've literally politicized it, right? Like we talk about, you know, supposedly our politics is supposed to stop at the water's edge. And in general, like there has been some consensus about, you know, national security um, in the center, right? There have always been hawkish Dems. There have always been moderate Republicans. And there's always sort of been a sense that no matter what the problem is, like we do want to kind of figure the national security part out in concert, right? Right. And this is, it's not just not only are we polarized to the point where that, national security and it's a larger issue is hard to discuss they can't get it straight in their own fucking circle <laughs> well i'm like <laughs> let's be honest with like uh, yes jared kushner's 36 like you know i have bias here i'm 35 but i also like don't think i should be shadow secretary of state anytime soon right <laughs> do you it's, think it's, one of obama's made mistakes was not putting you in charge of middle east peace i think that's it it would be, <laughs> would be all taken care of by now um yes. but it, it's not just the age it's like the lack of any kind of experience or knowledge of any of these things whatsoever also let's remember like jared was there every step of the way during uh, what was an incredibly racist, sexist campaign mm -hmm. filled with conspiracy theories, right? Like, he supported it all. This is not some person who's going to save us in any way, right? Um, also, like, you know, to pay, if you want to pick anyone to, like, help with Trump's populist new working class base, I don't think Jared Kushner and fucking Gary Cohn are the guys that you want to go to. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's bizarre, actually, you know, like if what has happened, if, if, if what we're seeing in the White House, is, if the reporting is in fact true, and who knows, like all these competing leaks and stuff, like I now kind of miss how the Obama people used to just tell us to fuck off, right? <laughs> like, that was always the answer you guys gave me <laughs> when I wanted when I wanted inside info. Um, I kind of miss those days. I miss not knowing exactly what's happening inside the White House. Um, uh, but, you know, apparently it's the populist, you know, alt-right people versus like the plutocrats. Right. This, this is not, that's not a good solution. You know? <laughs> no, that's why I keep saying it's, it's the, it's the rich versus the racists in yeah. the Trump White House. <laughs> yeah, we, we, you know, like, I don't know how we're expected to like find any good policy among them. And, and there is this sort of strange, I mean, I feel like I, I have to point out, like, I think that people give Jared and Ivanka all this credit for being supposedly more moderate and it's based entirely on style points. Yeah, of know? course it is. Yeah, it, it's 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 because they're just not vulgar. It is also you know? a it is a DC, New York media bias towards like Manhattanite socialites, right? Like mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like you know they're pretty people and they seem like they mean well and they talk to all the CEOs and you can reach out to them and they say the right things and they're going to be okay and it's like you know it's sort of a load of bullshit. And let's look at what's actually happened. So there's reporting now that Jared apparently was put in charge of Muslim community outreach. So right. that went great. <laughs> um, and Ivanka reached out to Cecile Richards, right? Did you guys talk about this? We just did. We just asked Cecile about it. And she said that uh, it doesn't seem to have had an effect. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
So, well, also remember, Ivanka was going to be the climate czar, too. She was going to because she very much believes in climate change. And now we're sitting here after, you know, Trump has ripped up all of the regulations that would fight climate change. So yeah. that didn't work either. I mean, what kind you know of who Trump... You know who Trump should hire is Jared and Ivanka's PR people. Because <laughs> those are the only people who have any skill in this administration. Because every time something good happens, it's like, it was Jared and Ivanka. Oh, my God. Did you guys or hear Javon- Or Javanka, Jared, as I call him. Jared did hire um, to do PR. Uh, who? It's the person, I'm not going to, I don't remember who it is name, but apparently it's the person who did PR for the Purge movie. <laughs> <laughs> well, those movies did very well, so... <laughs> That is too good. Um, Anna, who do you have on the uh, who do you have on with friends like these this week? I have an actual old friend of mine, Tom Frank, um, the what's the matter with Kansas guy, as he is sometimes, you know, I think forever yeah. associated with with that um, phrase and also the conceit, which has turned out to be like one of the most powerful like political ideas of our time. You know, the idea that um, people in red states, uh, middle class and lower middle class people in red states will vote against their economic interests if you can pander to them via social issues. Hey, it's worked. Yeah. (laughs) Um, And he has a new book out called Listen Liberal, um, which is about sort of the problems of of the Democratic Party to reach out to those voters and the professionalization of the Democratic Party and how it's kind of become associated with and seems to cater to the needs of people who are in your knowledge workers and professionals and that, you know, labor and working class and working class people of color too. He doesn't, unlike a lot of the critiques of this election, I think Tom doesn't really leave that part out of it. Good. Um, It's not just about reaching out to white working class. It's about reaching out to the working class in general. Um, And we talk about that. And also um, we talk about, I will be totally honest. There's some reminiscing about, Harmonized days back at WHPK at University of Chicago. Oh, nice! You know, listening to punk rock, arguing about who sold out first, um, which used to seem really important. Um, but now, I guess they're they're even. <laughs> we long for those days. <laughs> exactly. Um, well, everyone go listen. Everyone listen to that. That will come out on f- tomorrow, right? Tomorrow. tomorrow. And then also, um, anyone in LA should know that I am uh, doing a live version of the podcast in Pasadena at the Level Ground Festival, which is, I believe, level ground, on levelground.org um, on Saturday with Jeff Chu, who is a uh, gay person who also uh, came from an evangelical background and has sort of had a journey of making peace with his faith. And I think that's going to be a really interesting conversation. Awesome. Well, everyone go check it out. Um, thanks for dropping by. Always good. I, we'll, we'll see you later at the place with the thing. Yes, yes, at the time and location that we will. Are we, uh, are we tweeting out the location of the meeting for all pod fans? <laughs> Excellent. Thank you, Dan. All right. Well, everyone, we will um, we'll see you again. That's all we have for today. Quite a packed pod. But we will, um, we'll talk to you next week. Bye, guys. 